See, I try with all my might, but I just can't win a fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. And just when I ran out of road, how many men I didn't know, he told me that I am not alone. Pick me up, turn me around, place my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because he healed my heart. Choice but to believe my doubts are burning hey! like ashes in the wind. So, so long to my old friends, bird in the bitterness. You can keep it moving because you're not welcome here from now till I walk the streets of gold.
I can't do it for you. There's a song written on your heart only you can sing. And when you sing, enemies flee. When you sing, prison walls come falling down. When you sing, heaven invades the earth. So just begin to lift up your hallelujah. Raise it like a banner. Raise it like a flag. Raise it in the middle of the storm. Let it rise. Let it rise. Like a symphony to the king. Everything to you, Jesus. We raise it all up. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'll be right with you momentarily. And I'm back to preach to you. We've had several tech issues this morning, but we're going to find our way through it. I'm going to ask you, I hope you've been blessed already by our worship, the way that we're having to do service. Uh, unfortunately, this is the where we're at in our society with the attacks and with the things that are transpiring. So uh, unfortunately, this is what we are limited to. But I know that my God is bigger than what's going on in this world right now. I know that my God is bigger than the attacks that are against our church. And so I'm going to ask you, if you will touch and agree with me right now as we go to the Lord in prayer, praying over today's message, but I first want to pray over the body of Christ. I want to pray over the members of our church that are being afflicted by the enemy right now. Uh, every single one of our church family that has been uh, affected by COVID, affected by pneumonia affected by some sort of ailment or illness i want to touch and agree right now that in the mighty name of jesus those people are going to be made whole are going to be healed are going to be set free from this affliction so if you will uh 
touch, agree, bow your head with me. Lord, I come to you in the mighty name of Jesus right now. And I ask you right now in the name of Jesus that you would begin to break every yoke of bondage that has afflicted this church and all the other churches in the surrounding area. I ask you right now that every ailment that has risen up against the body of Christ, that it be pushed back, that you rebuke those things in Jesus' name. I ask that healing would come to every single person right now that has been affected by this. I ask that you would begin to move into hospital rooms, that you would begin to move into homes, and you would start to lay your hand upon every single person that has an ailment or an affliction right now. Lord, I ask that you would just do what you can only do, that you are the master healer. And so I ask that since you have all power and authority, that you would just minister to every single person in need right now, that you would go to the places that we can't get to and speak to the things that we can't change. And so, Lord, we trust every single one of these ailments into your hands right now, and we know that you are going to do a mighty thing through them. I ask you also that you would continue to anoint these lips of clay to speak what you have placed in my heart, that you would minister, even though we have to be removed from each other at this time, I ask that you would go through this way of media that we have been gifted with, and that you would speak an anointed word to every single person who is watching and receiving this word. Lord, we trust you that you are going to accomplish a good thing. Yes. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody agreed together by saying amen, amen and amen. Uh, we will not this week put the scriptures up on the screen due to our tech limitations at the moment. So you will have to follow along with me uh, if you want to believe that that's what the word says. Uh, before I get into the word, I want to remind every single person uh, who has the opportunity to view this, uh, I want to remind you that, Lord willing, we will be back together next Sunday. We will have a uh, normal service next Sunday, just the 11 a.m., not Sunday school, just the 11 a.m. next Sunday. This will be our last week without any in-person services. I believe the Lord is going to do some mighty works this week in people's bodies, and I believe that he is going to eradicate this so that we can resume uh, services. And so that is where we're at right now, next Sunday, 11 a.m., uh, here in the sanctuary in-person services. Uh, but I have a word from the Lord that I want to, I feel excited to be able to deliver to you. And so I want to read two very, very familiar passages to you. First being in Isaiah, the 59th chapter, verse number 19. And I only want to read the latter half of that passage. And it reads, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. And then I want to read another very familiar passage to you found in the book of Acts, the second chapter. And that would be verse number 38. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And so I want to minister for a few minutes as long as the Holy Spirit allows me to do so on a message titled, Raise the Standard. Yeah. Now, referring back to Isaiah 59 and 19, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him without seeking to break down the contextual understanding of what we see in the book of Isaiah chapter 59, I want to draw your focus to the very specific phrasing that was used there. The spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard. Now understand from your pastor that I have had 
my fair share of hermeneutical or uh, biblical interpretation discussions regarding this passage. And I understand that the most gravitated towards interpretation of this is that the word standard here is a banner or a flag. And, and I appreciate the conclusion that others have come to on this passage. And at times I myself may even come to the same conclusion for the sake of a sermon, for homiletical reasons. But if those watching and receiving this word today could permit for just the next few moments and allow the word to be a living word, allow the word to take on additional relevant meanings, then I would like to minister on the thought of lifting up or raising the standard. Now, I believe that in the modern church, we have done a good job. Actually, we've done at times a great job of accepting that more widely used translation, the thought or the idea of a standard being a flag. And in accepting that translation, we at times have fallen into the idea that being in possession of a flag gives us the ability to use such flags. And I believe that at times we, the church, for many reasons, we have waved flags that were never meant to be waved. I uh, really miss having the body together because, you know, we're getting to that point where the Holy Ghost is starting to stir some stuff. Uh, but we, a lot of times, have waved flags that were never meant for us to actually wave. Uh, we have waved yellow flags a lot of times, yielding with great caution when we were actually supposed to be marching forward. And we have at times waved red flags, declaring that we are in some sort of danger when we were actually supposed to trust that God had already gone before us and had taken care of the things before us. And yes, even at times, we, the church, have even waved white flags, uh, declaring that we were surrendering because we had just become weary in well-doing. And I feel like even at times during this pandemic, every time this sickness, this virus, this attack uh, raises its head up against the church, I feel like there have been numerous people who have taken out the flags and they have lifted up this flag and waved this flag, whether they're saying, look, I'm in danger or look, I'm surrendering because I just don't have the ability to push through anymore. And so we continue to just wave these flags. But even though many have viewed this translation as defining out as a banner or a flag, I would like to speak from this definition. The word standard defines out as a level of quality. Oh, uh, see, if you start to get ahead of me, you'll get this. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up or raise up the level of quality. Uh, help me, Holy Ghost. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise the quality of the response. I praise God for that thought right there, but some of you need to receive that in your spirit. When the enemy comes in like a flood, if I would just trust the Spirit of God and I would receive this word, it says that the Spirit, that same Spirit, 
spirit that dwells in me will raise the quality of my response. You see, when the enemy comes in on a normal daily basis and does things to attack me, I have a response. When the enemy tries to trip me up, I have a response. And I believe that the modern church has gotten to a place where we are semi-lackadaisical in our response to the enemy. And I think this scripture here in Isaiah was prophetic in nature. I think Isaiah was prophesying to a more modern church down the road, saying, look, there's going to come a point where the enemy will increase the attack or come in like a flood. And what you need to do is you need to allow the spirit of the Lord to raise the quality of the response that you give the enemy. Mm. I think that's why we're still struggling with things that we shouldn't be struggling with because we have not raised the quality of the response. But before I take us down that road, before I really deliver that part of the message, I want to lay a foundation for you. If you remember from weeks back in services, what your pastor has said to you is, is that a lot of times before we can deliver a really good point, We've got to wander you down a road. And so I want to wander you down a road for just a few minutes. In 1 Chronicles, the 13th chapter, verses 6 through 12, a wonderful, powerful grouping of passages. And it reads this, And David went up and all Israel to Balah, that is, to kirjath Jerem, which belonged to Judah, to bring up thence the ark of God the Lord, that dwelleth between the cherubims, whose name is called on it. And they carried the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadab. And Uzzah and Ahio drove the cart. And David and all Israel played before God with all their might. And was singing and with harps and with psalteries and with timbrels and with cymbals and with trumpets. And when they came unto the threshing floor of Chidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him, because he put his hand to the ark. And there he died before God. And David was displeased, because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. Wherefore that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of God that day, saying, How shall I bring the ark of God home to me? Mm. What a truly powerful passage there. In this passage, we read this tragic story about the death of Uzzah. If you'll allow for just a minute, I want to give you some background and some understanding to this passage here. The Ark of the Covenant had been captured by the Philistines nearly 20 years before David became king. The Ark was Israel's national treasure and most sacred object. It was the place where the presence of God dwelt among his people. Because of it being such a treasure to them, one day in battle, Saul determined that the ark had the power to save them. Not God, but rather the ark. And so he brought the ark into a battle with the Philistines without the blessing or without the instruction of God. Well, as many of you can probably imagine right now, that was not a good idea. Just so you'll know, doing things without the blessing or instruction of God is never a good idea. And so it wasn't a good idea, and tragedy soon followed. The Philistines defeated Israel that day and captured the ark. However, the Philistines did not hold on to it for very long. First, 
They put the ark in the temple of their idol, Dagon. But the presence of God destroyed their idol. And unfortunately, the Philistines did not learn from their idol being destroyed. And so what happens next while they're in possession of the ark is that a great plague comes over the city. And so they decide, you know what, we'll move the ark. But when they move the ark to a new city, the plague would appear there also. Eventually, the Philistines realized that the problem was not the plague. The problem was the ark. Because the Philistines had no business possessing the glory of God. And so the Philistines built themselves a new ark, a new cart. And they hitched this cart to a team of oxen. And they said, we're getting rid of the ark. And we're going to send it back to Jerusalem. And the ark only made it as far as Abinadab's house. Which happened to be about 20 miles outside of Jerusalem. And it remained there the rest of Saul's reign. When David became king and established his throne in Jerusalem, he decided to bring the ark back to the capital. He wanted to provide for the Israelites a focus for worship. He wanted to provide for the Israelites a rallying point, per se. David really just wanted the glory of God back in Jerusalem. I want you to understand right here, David's intentions were pure. I said David's intentions were pure. He had good intentions. His goal was good and godly. His motives were never the problem. In reality, the day when David finally accomplished that goal, it actually was probably one of the greatest days in David's life. However, in David's haste to do a good thing, in his zeal for the glory of God, David failed to take the time to learn the proper way to transport the ark. Even though the instructions were written in the pages of the law, David did not take the time to seek out the right way. If David had asked, any Levite would have been able to point David to the right passage. If you are unaware of Levitical law, let me share just a tidbit right here with you. The ark was to be carried on the shoulders of the priests. That is how God always intended for the ark to be moved. Instead of gathering the priests to transport the ark, David built a brand new cart to transport it. Hmm. Now, here's a very good question for you. If you've never stopped and thought about it. If you've read these passages and you never stop to think about this, David built a new cart to transport the ark. Where do you think David got that idea? He did not get it from God. Nowhere in scripture can you find God given instructions telling David that he needed to build a cart for the transportation of the ark. That idea didn't come from God. No, that idea he got from the Philistines. Get this here. The only time the ark was ever carried on a cart was when the Philistines sent it back home. So David, instead of consulting God, he instead took his cues from the Philistines, the very people who stood against God, the very people who stood against the things of God. Can I go ahead and just preach for one second right here? 
David really looked at the world that stood against the ways and knowledge of God. And David said, well, if the Philistines are going to do things this way and not have any kind of issues or problems, then clearly that will probably work for us as well, those that are called by God. Understand this preacher today, when it comes to choosing who to take cues from, you need to understand their ways are not our ways. Their solutions are not our solutions. Their tools are not our tools. Their weapons are not our weapons. Anytime we choose to blindly receive cues from a godless world, anytime we choose to blindly receive cues from a carnal society, we are going to seriously mess things up. David, following the worldly example of the Philistines, carried the ark of God on a cart out of the house of Abinadab. And Uzzah and Ahio drove the cart. Let me continue with a sidebar thought for just another moment. You need to get this here. David got this bright idea from the enemy. He then wrote this idea out to his people and said, hey, Uzzah, hey, yo, I need you to drive this idea home. Hear this. If you're going to involve other people in your plans, you better make sure your plans come from the Lord. Yeah. Mm. I said, if you're going to involve other people in your plans, you better make sure your plans come from the Lord. And so the scene in this passage unfolds before our eyes. David and all Israel played before God with all their might and with singing and with harps and psalteries and with timbrels and with cymbals and trumpets. I mean, there was a great cause for celebration because the ark was coming home. Then it happened. The oxen stumbled and Uzzah reaches out and steadies the ark on the cart. And at this point, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and he smote him because he put his hand on the ark and there he died before God. David was afraid of God that day saying, how shall I bring the ark of God home to me? After the disaster, after the disaster, when it was too late to matter, as the oxen stood there in their harness and Uzzah's body lay dead, at that point then and only then did David seriously ask the question that he should have asked from the beginning. How shall I bring the ark of God home to me? Somehow, David got so caught up in the zeal of doing a good thing that he forgot to consult the word. He neglected to ask God himself how the ark is supposed to to be moved. Had he asked, the answer was there. Had he only asked, Uzzah would not have had to have died. But David waited until it was too late to finally ask the right question. He was blind to the danger that he was walking into. He thought everything was okay. He was sure that this had to be the will of God. He was certain that God would approve of what he was doing. As a matter of fact, he was so certain that he was right that he neglected to ask God until it was too late. Right. Too many times we can be so sure that we are doing right that we fail to fact check the plans with the one source that we should. 
Mm. Understand this. Uzzah did not have to die. The ark could have gone home that day if David had not followed the influence of the enemy. Wow, Pastor, uh, that's such a powerful thought right there. Simple but powerful. But I'm not seeing how that connects to where this message started. Isaiah 59 and 19 says, When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. When the enemy comes in like a flood. Now, I know because I have heard the conversations and have been a part of them, I also don't want to delve into the idea of punctuation restructuring in order to yield a different contextual outcome in this passage, focusing on just what we read as it is penned. Can I point out an amazing truth for you? When the enemy comes in like a flood, hear this pastor right now, the only times the enemy comes in, period, is to stop something good from progressing. And the only times uh, the enemy comes in like a flood uh, is when the enemy sees uh, an imminent threat. Help me, Holy Ghost, now. I need to speak to somebody's spirit right now in order for the enemy to come in like a flood. There had to be somebody that was doing something right. There had to be those that were positioned in the right place, making right strides that caused the enemy to view them as a threat. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, his entire goal is to cause them to stop being a threat. Before I get back to what I was preaching, you need to hear this preacher. The enemy has come in like a flood because good things were happening. Good things were taking place. Good things were unfolding. People were being divinely positioned. And the enemy started looking and saying, I see a threat. I see a threat being created. I see a threat being formed. And I cannot allow them to continue down the path that they have been walking. See, this is what happened to David. That's how they connect here when the Philistines sent the ark on a cart back to Israel. That was the enemy sending his ideas, his plans, his thoughts, his influence right into the minds of God's people. The enemy did that because he knew if God's people get where they should be, then they will become a greater threat unto us. And so we witnessed that unfold in our church. In the last couple weeks, we have seen the enemy come in like a flood because we were divinely positioned, because we were making right strides, because we were doing the right things, because we were becoming a threat. So the enemy says, I will come in like a flood. If I had a church full of people right now, this is where you would amen this preacher. If you are not a part of this body, but you bear witness with the truth, you can amen me as well. The enemy has come in like a flood, not just here, but it has come in like a flood to churches all over this great nation, to homes, to lives, because he sees a major threat being formed before his eyes. Now this is where we reach a crossroad of decision. Come on. David looked at what the enemy did and he said, I think I will take a page out of the enemy's book. I think I like the approach that I witnessed and David let the enemy dictate or influence the steps he would take. 
I'll preach this Holy Ghost to these people right now. We can do the exact same thing that David did in this current day and hour. We can be just like David and we can choose to let the enemy influence us. But hear this pastor today, if you let the enemy influence your next step, influence your next choice, the only outcome is going to be death. Right. Come on. Oh, Holy Ghost, Come on. preach to them now. I said if you follow the cues from David and you say I'm going to let the enemy influence my choice, influence my step, influence my direction, the only outcome is going to be just like what David saw, which is a death, a death of a ministry, a death of a future, a death of a promise. When the enemy comes in like a flood, sometimes it is so hard to not want to just wave a flag and just yield. But that has gone on long enough in way too many saints' lives. I prefer the approach of when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise the quality. Hallelujah, Jesus. What does that mean, Pastor? I am so glad you asked me because I'm preaching to every Holy Ghost-filled saint right now. The word again says in Acts 2 and 38, and Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We have the Holy Ghost. Hear me. We have been filled with the Spirit. This is not an abundant grace thing. This is not a UPC thing. This is a Holy Ghost thing. The Lord is speaking to every Spirit-filled saint right now. Even if you're sitting in a hospital room, sick in body, but you're Spirit-filled, the Lord is speaking to you right now. Even if you're another minister from another church and you've tuned in and the enemy is attacking your church, the Lord is speaking to you right now. The enemy has come in like a flood and we cannot be letting the enemy influence the steps we take. Influence through fear. Influence through fatigue. Influence through doubt. Influence through anxiety. Instead of allowing any kind of influence, the Lord is compelling this church this modern body of spirit-filled believers to let the Holy Ghost raise the standard. Let the Holy Ghost raise the quality. What are you saying, preacher? Again, I'm glad you asked. I'm saying stop taking advice from every carnally led person. Stop taking advice from every lying serpent. Stop taking advice from every broken system. Stop leaning on your own understanding. Start yielding to the Holy Ghost in ways you have not done yet. And when you do, the Holy Ghost will raise the quality of what you are doing. The quality of your prayer time. The quality of your worship. The quality of your warfare. The quality of your weapons. Uh, those weapons that are mighty through God for the pulling down of every stronghold. The enemy has come in like a flood. The question is, will you let him shape your path towards death or will you raise the standard? Let me say that again for somebody right now. The enemy has come in like a flood. So the question from the Lord this morning is, will you let him shape your path towards death or will you raise the standard? For me and my house, for this church, for this place, we will raise the standard. Yes. 
Raise the standard in our fasting. Raise the standard in our praying. Raise the standard in our consecration. We will raise the standard. I'm getting ready to close. There's a phenomenal story that is found in Acts chapter 27 and chapter 28. When Paul was off the coast of Malta being flooded by the waves of destruction, he had to find his way to safety on whatever fragments were left from the ship. Hear this, pastor, as I sat in prayer yesterday over this word. Lord, speak to me. Speak to everyone that's going to tune in. Speak to this church. Lord, speak to me. And the Lord began to speak to me and said, the enemy has come in like a flood, seeking to dismantle all that surrounds you, leaving you to grasp only to a fragment of what once was. But I'm here to tell you this morning, if you will raise the standard in these last days and hours, you will see the greatest move of God through your life that you have ever seen. We are in uncharted waters. I understand that. The flood is all around us. I understand that. The enemy has come in like a flood. But it is time for us all, every spirit-filled saint of God, to raise the standard. It is time for this church to raise the standard. Raise the standard in our homes. Raise the standard in our prayer closets. It is time for us to raise the standard this morning. Hear me. I'm closing right now. I'm closing right now. Hear me. I'm pouring my heart out to you this morning. We have responded to every attack retroactively. We've been conditioned to be retroactive people. And so our standard is a standard of a retroactive response. But I feel an unction of the Holy Ghost to tell you it's time to let the Spirit raise the standard. To put us in a place of moving forward. To go on the offense. On the offense on our knees. On the offense in our fasting. We need to raise the standard of what we have been fighting with and how we have been fighting. Because the enemy has come in like a flood. Now we need to yield to the Holy Ghost and let the Holy Ghost raise the standard within us. I encourage you this week to let this word speak to your hearts and speak to your minds. Pray about this word. Seek God like never before. Hear me, the enemy is trying to influence your path and to shape your path towards inevitable death. But God is reaching out to his people this morning because he's wanting to raise the standard in these last days and hours. I pray over every single person watching this that the Lord speak to your heart and mind this week. And I look forward to being back together with you all on Sunday. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Have a blessed week. Thank you for joining us today.